Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 20 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. And today I'm joined by Dr. Jason Klopp, who's a naturopathic doctor who's considered to be an influencer in naturopathic medicine by the ANMC. Dr. Klopp is on a journey to educate, empower, and treat those on their journey with digestive challenges. His exclusive focus is on those struggling with irritable bowel syndrome and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Dr. Klopp finds that there is a lot of conflicting information available as it relates to SIBO, and it is his intention to provide information and resources that clarify and promote the understanding of SIBO and how it can be overcome naturally. Dr. Klopp finds immense journey in serving and empowering patients in getting results while supporting them through the holistic journey to a complete and lasting recovery. And on today's episode, we talk about his clear protocol and why he developed that to support the return to health for his SIBO patients. And if you're looking for some additional support with your own SIBO journey, my SIBO coaching program is coming to you very soon. And I have opened uh, the registrations for people who are interested in finding out more. There's no obligation to sign up to the program. But if you let me know that you're interested in the SIBO coaching program, where I guide you through how to live with this chronic and painful condition as someone who has been able to succeed successfully treat it herself, then I do implore that you sign up because once registrations close, I'll be closing it off for a period of time and you'll have to wait until the next intake. So simply head to thehealthygut.co forward slash interest and you can put your name down to find out more about the program. So let's get on to the interview with Dr. Jason Klopp. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jason Klopp. It's really great to have you here today. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I'm quite enjoying the experience so far, and I look forward to really jumping into some amazing content for you and your wonderful audience. Yeah, thank you. So you... um predominantly specialize in people with um, who have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, or SIBO. So I'd love to um, hear more about how you came to be a naturopathic doctor specializing in these two very important um, fields, especially for me and my listeners. Sure thing, yeah. And to, to really do this justice, I'm going to have to go back in time just a little bit. And so I actually grew up on a dairy farm. And I'm from Canada, as you know, a lot of people think I'm actually from the States just because I do have a lot of American patients. But I grew up on a small dairy farm in Chilliwack. And on the farm, I was always attracted to the animals that were sick or needed some extra tender loving care to get by. And as I was growing up, I thought, I really want to be a veterinarian because any time the vet came over to our farm, I'd be following him, I'd be looking over his shoulder, I'd be asking him how I could help him. And so that really was my drive, my focus. At one point, though, when I was in my mid-teens, I was actually 15 years old, I got an illness, and it's it's mono, I'll just share with you guys. And it's, you know, more of an acute-type illness, although it can have a lot of uh, long-term consequences to it. And so my my parents took me to our conventional uh, family doctor, and first of all, they thought, oh, he's got strep throat, so they gave me an antibiotic for strep throat, took it three days later or so, still not feeling better, actually feeling much, much worse. And so my parents, not willing to, uh, you know, just give up with it, they, they took me back and they actually did a swab, they tested, sure enough, it's mono, and the doctor just said to me, you're going to have to go home, you're going to have to rest, in about a year's time, you should start to be feeling, you know, like you used to be. And... I was just like, what? Here I am, a 15-year-old, you know, into sports, into soccer, into, you know, school education. I worked a lot on the farm and all these things. Like, to me, taking one full year to to get back my health seemed unreasonable. And thankfully, my parents felt the same way. And so they took me to a naturopathic doctor and with some very... um, you know, straightforward treatments that actually included IV hydrogen peroxide therapy. Within three days, I was at about 95% uh, of full health and, and vitality that I once had. And just for some context here, 
I was actually lying in the back seat of my dad's truck, hardly able to swallow, drink, eat, and spitting any extra saliva, which is kind of gross, into a bucket just because it was so painful to swallow. And in three days, my health radically shifted and changed. And it was at that moment where I knew I need to be able to help other people do the same. And so, you know, fast forward, you know, several years, well, quite a few years at this point, and getting into medicine and really understanding, like, how do I want to serve others? And what always came back to me was that feeling of, of loss or not having a clear direction or hope that my practitioner, my healthcare provider would be able to take care of me. Because before that, it was always just like, anytime I'm sick, I would just go to my doctor and, you know, they would just be able to help me. And that realization that they couldn't and that I felt no help was so such a devastating one. And so when I got into medicine myself and decided about how I wanted to focus and really where I wanted to practice and focus my efforts, it was always on who can I help that felt like me because that was a horrible sensation. And so that was where I turned to more of the digestive health and SIBO specifically because there is not a lot of awareness from a conventional perspective. And there's a lot of, you know, people saying you can never get better, you will never get better. And it's just a really frustrating place for them to be in. It's something I can strongly identify with. And it's really with that experience allowed me to provide more support and optimism and encouragement and helping people through that journey. I think that your experience, sadly, is one that so many of us, and myself included, have experienced. And one thing that I'm always left wondering is why does traditional medicine seem to fail so often, especially with chronic illness? And I'd love for you to share your viewpoints on why you think that our standard care practitioners just don't seem to always get it right, unfortunately. Yeah, and this is kind of multifaceted for sure. And so what I'll say to begin with is is that they have gotten it right in a lot of instances. Lifespan has increased, uh, you know, birthing process, the, the amount of women that died as a result of it, vaccinations have made a massive, massive difference. But your distinction here was key, and that was chronic illnesses. And so I think what I want to just emphasize is that they have a definite, definite role but that role should be encompassing of other modalities and therapies that are proven to work either with the science or hundreds to thousands of years of effect. Just take Chinese traditional medicine as an example. And so the primary differences though are in the thought process or the thinking or the approach to disease and illnesses. And so the conventional system has generally, and I'm going to say this generally because there's there's always exceptions, but generally has more of a reactionary approach to healthcare. So you have a symptom, what can we use to counteract or reduce or remove that symptom? And that in and of itself in many cases works, but in these chronic type disease cases, symptoms are not always just easily equaled out or removed with some form of therapy. It's often multifaceted, involves different organs, different organ systems, they're correlated, they're connected in different ways. And so if you're missing some of the key components, it's going to be lacking. And so more reactionary versus the other side of the thinking is how can I prevent this? Or what are the obstacles that allow this to present itself within our lives? And so if we think just generally speaking that we're born healthy and, and we have a, a, you know, a full healthy immune system and these types of things, there should be really no obvious reasons other than some genetic components why we should get sick. Now, the environment comes into it you know, emotionally, physically, what we're eating and all of these things will then impact health. And so what were the things that created an obstacle that compounded over time to allow this illness to prevent itself or to present itself. And so that is what typically happens. And so how can we go back in time a little bit and not just look at the outcome, but look at what allowed this to become a problem to begin with, remove that obstacle and then support the body through and to care. And so those are some of the key ones. And another side of it is, is I think, alternative or you know integrative or whatever form of you know medicine you want to call yourself in or put yourself under 
I think what really allows the alternative field the real benefit is is that we focus a lot more, at least I'll speak for myself, on support, on follow-up, on accountability that is really necessary to overcome this. And so with the conventional system, you're typically seen more as a number and you're pushed into a system that's extremely overburdened in many, if not all countries, and there's definitely not enough funding. And so that is a real problem. That's more of a systems problem. And, and then there's the other side of it, which is the educational and philosophy problem. I've got a recent experience, actually, where I went to a traditional general practitioner, um, GPs as what we call them here in Australia, and then my naturopath. And it was following my trip to Thailand. And unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I was caught in a flood and picked up a suspected parasite. I came home with something which was really devastating to me because I'd worked really hard not to get sick and I ended up in a lot of pain. So much pain that I asked my partner to take me to the doctors because I was worried that I might have been hemorrhaging or something really bad was happening because I was in excruciating agony. And the doctor said, I don't really know what's wrong with you. It doesn't look like anything major is happening. You may have a parasite. You may have something else. Here's some really heavy hitting antibiotics. Come back in 24 hours if you don't improve and then we'll run some tests. And I thought, no, I've just worked so hard at getting my gut in a better state. I'm not willing to take anything just yet. Let's see if there's another option. So my naturopath saw me and she said, look, given you were in dirty flood water for 10 days, it's likely you've picked up something. We've got some herbal products that you can try. Let's see how you feel. Again, if you're not feeling better quickly, then we need to do further analysis. And the difference between seeing the GP and my naturopath was that I've never heard from the GP again, despite presenting in a lot of pain. And she even said, gosh, you don't look well. My naturopath has sent me a text every day um, saying, how are you doing? Are you better today? How's your bowel movements? How's the pain? And I feel great now. And whatever I had has worked and has, I've responded well to the herbal supplements that we did. But it just really highlights the difference between going to a general practitioner where you really do feel like a number. You've got 15 minutes with them and they've got to try and guess what's wrong versus a naturopath who's a lot more invested, it seems to me anyway, in the overall health, in uh, what's gone wrong and really wanting to support you to get back to health. Mm, and... and in the line of chronic disease are these types of symptoms that support co component is so necessary especially considering you know what classifies the disease as chronic well it's been existing for three months and or longer up to years and years and and i, I interact and chat with people and patients who have been having and dealing with this for years and years and years and that begins to wear on you mentally and emotionally and so if you don't have that side of the support there i truly don't think that you're ultimately going to get the results you're looking for Mm, yeah. And you do work with a lot of people with IBS and SIBO. So would you be able to talk to us around the types of people that you see coming through your practice? Are they the people that have been experiencing these conditions for many years and are looking for alternative solutions? Or are they people that um, where it's just started and they're coming to you because they found you? Like who's coming through your practice? I would say it's a combination of both. My, my preference, because I love helping people to get the best outcomes and results, are those who are just starting out on the journey. But I definitely get people who have gone through the whole gamut. They've done the whole conventional system with all of the testing and imaging and all of the investigative studies and therapies, as well as all the pharmaceuticals, many, many of the uh, herbal antibiotics and, and just general supplements and things of those nature. But generally what I see is, is, is definitely a mix. So some of the first, but I, I am more focused on trying to educate and get people to jump into this thing sooner. And I recognize a little bit of the challenge here being that the conventional system is definitely generally covered by insurance and things of that nature. And so to make an out of pocket investment on the you know, starting line is a little harder. And so just generally speaking, I think alternative care practitioners, naturopathic doctors, they see um, conditions after they've gone through the full conventional system. But generally, my preference is, is to get them in the earlier stages where they have not tried everything. And so that's my general preference. Although 
I definitely see a mix of both. I would probably say about 50-50. And what I, you know, what I do with my patients or prospective patients is, is that I don't just accept anybody. And so I actually screen people based on whether or not I truly feel I can help them in getting results. And so if I don't feel that I can truly help them in getting results, then I'll actually forward them on to someone else or a different kind of care practitioner. And really, again, thinking about what are some of those obstacles that are preventing healing. And if it is indeed something that's related to the bacterial overgrowth, I feel like I can handle that. But if it's something separate, and in a lot of cases it is, if they've gone through years and years of treatment and therapies trying to eradicate this overgrowth and it's not worked, something else is going on that is preventing the body from healing. And so in those preliminary discussions, I'm discussing that as a potential, as well as looking for missing pieces that may not have been considered as far as as what may have made treatment more effective if they had incorporated it. And so generally, uh, that's the sort of approach. And so if someone has come to me and they've got a lot of, you know, other concerns, let's say they've got fibromyalgia and Lyme's disease and just a whole host of other issues, I don't feel like the focus in all cases, but some cases shouldn't necessarily be on, okay, how can we just eradicate SIBO considering they may have been trying to do that same approach for several years. And so then I don't feel like what I have to offer necessarily will be ultimately what helps them get better. And so at the end of the day, it comes down to me really just caring about people and wanting them to do what is necessary to get better. And so it might mean, you know, look, I think what you're doing right now, you should adjust it, do this, do that first, then reach out to me. And so really trying to identify with them in those preliminary discussions or discussion about what may be their next best step. And if I'm that next best step, then that's great. But if not, then I like to point them to what I believe would be their next best step. I think it's a really interesting point that you make around it being, and I've talked about this several times on the podcast episodes and previous episodes, around being your own private investigator and really uncovering what is going wrong in your body in order to allow SIBO to occur, but also what other factors or conditions are at play to keep you unwell and really investigating it and finding a team of people. Sometimes you need a team of people that can work with you collaboratively to help your health return back to a good and ideally optimal level. And I think sometimes we want it to be just one person that we see, one doctor, for instance, that we can see that has a magic wand that they can wave over ourselves and fix it all. And sometimes they can, but especially with chronic long-term illness, I think that they peel back the layers of the illness or illnesses to find what is really going on and address it in a multifaceted approach. I 100% agree. And I, and I, I think what it comes down to as a part of that is, is the physician or practitioner recognizing their own limitations and shortcomings as it relates to these other illnesses. And so I understand my role, but if I'm really honest, I know that I'm not a pro at, at dealing with or approaching Lyme's disease mostly because I've not you know, pursued further education in that field and don't have a ton of clinical experience on it. And so I just feel, again, if at the end of the day we're thinking about how can we help people get the best results, then it should be about who's best suited for them. And that's a big reason why I've divested so much of my energy and attention on just the digestive system. Now, there's other systems that all come into play, but if I feel something or some other piece is going to be necessary to really tip them over the edge and get the results they're looking for, I definitely advocate for bringing on other team members. And just as a part of my own team, I, 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 I have my own people that help with my patients as well, because definitely, I mean, I'm not the best when it comes to nutrition. So I'd rather just hire someone to work with my patients to do that. And so I think that's key, you know, and I think honestly, what really attracts me to medicine and these types of cases is that investigative or, you know, private eye detective sort of work. I really, really enjoy that. And I think there's a part of it that that you can gather with science and labs and all these other things. But there's another part that really means that you're tapping into your intuition and you're tapping into and connecting with another person energetically. And when you're doing that, you can get a much better understanding of where that person is at. And just, you know, out of interest sakes, what I'll share with you is, is that 
sometimes someone will come to me and they, they tell me they've tried everything, they've done everything, they've explored everything, they've gone to all of the best doctors all across North America and potentially beyond, and I'll say to them, what do you think is wrong? What do you think is preventing you from healing? And so many times, I would say nine out of ten times, they would say, you know what, nobody has ever asked me that question before. And so I truly believe that we're much more aware of what is ultimately preventing us from healing and if we're able to just tap into that in a much better way and or work with a practitioner who will enables you to tap into that sense that can you know warrant very very powerful information now again of course the labs and the imaging and all of these things are very beneficial but that ability is something that is it's very very powerful now and moving forward in regards to treating and then preventing long term I think that's really powerful and those that have been dealing with the kind of condition for many years are often quite well educated in their condition because they've gone and learnt a lot and I've done that. I've became a little bit obsessed about SIBO and hey, I now do a podcast about gut health so I can keep learning. (laughs) And I think that having the approval of someone in a position of authority like a medical doctor saying, what do you think is wrong is really powerful. And like you say, I don't think many people are asked that question and I hope that many of the practitioners listening to today's podcast might like to incorporate that into their practice. Your treatment of people with IBS and SIBO has led you to develop a protocol called the CLEAR or C-L-E-A-R protocol. Would you like to talk us through what that actually is and how you apply it? Sure, I'd love to. And so what ultimately happened for me was is that I was finding a lot of people were struggling with how do we deal with foods? When can we eat what? How much? When, you know, legal, illegal, you know, all of these different questions. And, and I was sort of boggled down by it. And I oftentimes joke that I'm a very simple guy. I'm a simple practitioner. And so I like to just keep things simple and break it down into its easiest components. And that's kind of a joke because I, you know, I spent so much of my life in, in, in furthering my education and I continue to today. But the bottom line is, is that if we try to prevent or, or present a plan or a treatment guideline that is too complicated or too difficult for somebody to follow, then they're very like, unlikely to be able to follow it. And so I thought, well, how can I make it so they don't need to be reading out of a book or they don't need to be complicating the food process? And so what this CLEAR protocol, and CLEAR is an acronym, what it ultimately stands for is is consciously eating legal foods, earn, alert, and restore. And so we're going to go into these in more detail. And I believe you also have a resource, Rebecca, where people can get some more of the background information on this. And I'm always open to some of the questions that may come. What I want to preface this with is is that I typically advocate for introducing this clear protocol following eradication. And so, again, there's a lot of distinctions and a lot of different opinions on during treatment following treatment, uh, pre-treatment, all of these things, the length of time, which foods and all of these types of things. And we can definitely get into a lot more. But, you know, given that the time, I typically suggest this following eradication, although components of this can definitely be powerful when introduced uh, during, following, pre at any point. And so, If you want me to, uh, Rebecca, I'll just sort of jump in and start explaining these. And maybe between each section, we can just have a little bit of back and forth dialogue and you can ask for any clarity. How does that sound? That sounds great. Awesome. And so consciously eating, that's the C. And so please, if you guys are sitting around and you've got a pen and paper in front of you, feel free to write this down. Otherwise, Rebecca is going to provide you a resource to get some of this information. So do not fret. So C, consciously eating. What I recognized is is that over the years and over the decades and generations, there's always been a emphasis on creating enemies within our food repertoire, if you will. It was eggs at one point. It was butter at another point. It was margarine was the thing to do. And it was just always something. 
and wheat and you know so many different things now you may be sitting at home and thinking oh well i do have an allergy or a sensitivity to one of those things that i mentioned i understand but that doesn't mean that everybody should be avoiding those things especially if they're mean you know being introduced as synthetics as in margarine or other types of foods and so consciously eating really means seeing food and all food as inherently good despite its label or social stigma and so if we create this energetic feeling or awareness around a food that it's bad then do you think even with sufficient healing recovery and repair our body is going to be able to differentiate between what is good and bad based on our psychology of what we have pre predetermined it to be and so consciously eating really at the root of it means that you've got to enjoy the food that you do have and you've got to have gratitude and mindfulness around eating and so just kind of with our day-to-day -day lives we're always in a rush we're always running from a to b to c and, and i'll put myself in that category but i put a lot of attention on before having a meal i sit down and i love to, to be with family if i can be because i think that is another big missed opportunity for you know culturally it was so important and it's become less important but sitting down and if you're a spiritual or religious type of person having a prayer before a meal otherwise doing some deep belly breaths before a meal some people will light a candle before a meal just to signify the, the the stopping and then the starting of something that is important and really necessary for you and so even if your diet is limited at this point still have appreciation for what you do have because if you begin to cultivate appreciation for what you do have with time you'll be able to expand that and so take that time eat slowly chew plenty and really enjoy the food that you are able to heat eat and don't forget that there's many who do not have the blessing of having any food and so really consciously eating and consciously being aware of the process of eating you know feeling and tasting the sensation and, and the savoriness of food because that in of itself will really kick your digestive system into gear because let's be honest you know eating even starts or the digestive cycle or system starts before you even put the food into your mouth and so once you start smelling your your salivary enzymes are being released already and then you place it onto your tongue and you're tasting it and, and lingual lipase is released and it starts digesting the carbohydrates and so digestion starts really really early and so it's really important to put a lot of attention on the part that comes before the stomach you know sort of we typically think oh digestion happens in the stomach and then a lot of it is absorbed into the small and large intestine yeah that's got truth to it but if it's not started correctly to begin with those follow-up sequences are going to be largely impeded and so focus on consciously eating and how you feel with what you're eating because as we proceed through this you're going to be able to tap into that conscious aspect of it it's a really valid point you are making one in which i needed to address on my own journey to health and i remember distinctly the day that i addressed conscious eating because prior to that i'd been so angry about the food i could not eat when i went on the SIBO treatment program and followed the SIBO biphasic diet and when I caught myself, I realised, hey, Rebecca, get a grip. You do have plenty of food to eat. It's just not bad food. It's actually really good food. And I started employing breathing techniques and being grateful of the food that I did have in front of me and being really mindful of how I ate and switching off all electronic devices and turning the TV off so that I wasn't distracted when I ate and really consciously thinking about every single mouthful that went into my mouth and how it was nourishing me and helping to heal me and that it was giving my body the nutrients that it needed at this very moment to help it return to health. My symptoms decreased so quickly after I stopped doing that and I really felt like my recovery sped up because I just changed how I thought about things. And my naturopath, it was really interesting, she had never had a patient go through a journey like that themselves, like I'd discovered it for myself. 
and she now employs that with her patients and can see that it is a really great step to us returning to health, even if we are left at this point in time eating chicken and maybe some jasmine rice and some carrots. If we can eat these three foods, it's so wonderful we can eat these three foods. And I really like the point that you made that there's plenty of people out there that don't have food. And I think that those of us in the Western world, we are so bombarded with food advertisements and supersized meals. We've been conditioned by clever marketers to think that we have this abundance of food around us at all times. And it's just marketing. And I think getting a reality check sometimes can be really beneficial to move forward in our health and be aware that if all you've got today is three foods then that's great and tomorrow you can have four and the next day you might have five and calming the system down it's such an important um lesson jason i completely agree and i mean just think about it this way if you're if you're really anxious in anticipating a new food it's kind of like going up and giving a public presentation, right? Your belly kind of knots up. You may have to run to the toilet to, you know, you know, get rid of some excess there because you're just really nervous. And so if you apply that same feeling or sensation to food and even the reintroduction of food, it can really create symptoms that are not even correlated or related to the food that you're ingesting. Rather, your, your you know, the stress response that comes as as anticipation of what you're about to eat. And so, and I and I'm fully aware of the challenge, especially when people have been avoiding certain foods for long periods of time. The reintroduction process can be challenging, but what can make it easier is bringing the gratitude and the appreciation and and really the the love of food back because as i was talking about a little bit earlier our bodies aren't that good at differentiating what physically we're experiencing and what mentally we're thinking and so it's just kind of like again let's think about going up uh, and speaking in front of a crowd i mean it's all about our thinking It's not anything to do with, oh, well, we're going to have to step up five steps and stand on a platform. I mean, we would do it with nobody in front of us. And so it's the same sort of thing. Our bodies are conditioning a response based on what we perceive that experience is going to be like. And so if we prejudge a meal like it's not going to be a good one or we're going to experience horrible symptoms as a result of it, then chances are it's going to be similar to getting up on stage in front of a full audience And it's got nothing to do with the fact that we've walked up the five steps and and stood on a platform. It's got everything to do with how we're thinking they're thinking about us, or at least that's my experience of it. I hear from a lot of people and it really is sad because it's a common thread in messages from people, which is I'm terrified of new food is what they're basically saying to me. So if someone is in a state at this point in time where they are really eager to introduce foods, but they're so scared because in the past they've had really strong reactions. Perhaps it's caused some pretty immediate bloating or caused them to have diarrhea or constipation or abdominal pain. What's a really practical way that they can, let's say they want to introduce pumpkin or some squash in their diet because they love it and it's pre previously caused some problems how can people identify that they are being really stressed about it in the first place i do wonder whether people do think that they are okay but subconsciously they're holding on to a lot of stress fear and anxiety around food what's your advice on how to even address that um, and see if you might be coming from a negative perspective Mm -hmm. and that's a that's a great one And and again i i don't want to minimize that experience because it's a real one for a lot of people and the other side of this is, is though, that if we continue to limit our diet that restrictively for a long period of time, it is going to have a serious negative impact on our health, not on just digestion, but all of the other organ systems. And so it is critical, critical to be able to expand the diet. And so one is effectively treating the problem, which let's presume in this case is, is this bacterial overgrowth. And it may, conter- you know, there may be other components to it, like fungus, like parasites and others. But one is, you know, really focusing on getting treatment. And then two is understanding the importance of reintroduction, because it is really, really critical. And what I typically suggest, and, and you know, we can discuss this a little bit as we go, but 
don't try generally if you're if you have concerns about a new food don't try to you know eat a whole pumpkin if you will right take a little bit and eat it and mix it in with a meal that you already know you're okay with and do the types of things that we discussed consciously eating uh you know the breath work the gratitude the appreciation find yourself in a comfortable relaxed environment to to reintroduce or rechallenge that food and so start low and slowly work your way up to a point now what I often see too is is that it's like wow I, I went from carrots and jasmine rice to now introducing uh, pumpkin and so it's like yeah I can have pumpkin so they have pumpkin every single day for weeks on end and that in and of itself can create another allergy type sensitivity response and so it's crucial when reintroducing foods you know have you know be excited about it if your body agrees with it but don't overdo them because that can in and of itself create other problems and so I don't know if I'm specifically answering um, your question. I mean, a part of it is is if you're if you've never rechallenged that food since, and so let's say a month ago you tried it, and in the month since you've been treating, you've been healing, you've been repairing the digestive tract and digestive lining, then you know we can then presume that in that time period given that your symptoms are reduced you know let's say you've got gas bloating constipation and or diarrhea all of those are trending and improving well then it should mean that it it, it, it can be time to reintroduce those and so i um i think though that it is it is really really critical to to try and challenge them because what we have to remember here is 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 it's not that it's the food that's the problem it's actually the bacteria in this case that are the problem that are eating the food and they're causing the symptoms. And so we've got to separate the food from the actual pathology or dysbiosis or overgrowth. And so if we're treating the overgrowth and we're eradicating it, then it's no longer the food, but it becomes about the food because we correlate eating food to the symptoms. And the symptoms are caused because the bacteria are consuming that food and, and resulting in the bloating and all the other things. And so if we can begin to separate those and understand that if you are treating effectively, then the food in and of itself should be fine. Now, there's always going to be, ex, you know, exceptions. A lot of people are sensitive to dairy and wheat and, you know, egg and corn and soy and these types of things. So there may be some things long term that you've got to avoid. But generally speaking, you can handle with effective treatment much more than you currently are. I think that's a really important point that you make around that it's the bacteria, not the food necessarily that's causing the problem. And we get so fixated on the food. And using pumpkin as an example, I love pumpkin, but when I was going through my treatment, I couldn't tolerate it. Despite it being considered legal in the semi-restricted phase of the biphasic diet, which is what you move to reasonably quickly. And I introduced not too much, but maybe half a cup or a quarter of a cup of pumpkin, and I had quite a strong reaction to it. I was quite upset about it at the time, but I spoke to my naturopath and she said, you might just not be ready for it yet. It's fine, but let's reintroduce it at a later point. And I kept testing it every couple of weeks to one month. And I'd test it and I'd have a bit of a flare. Um, but finally, my body was able to tolerate it again and I beat it. And it wasn't a problem. And so, like you say, it's about where you are in your journey and what you may not be able to eat today it doesn't mean that you might not be able to ever eat it again. And I just looked forward to having pumpkin back in my life. I was really happy when it came back and I celebrated it. And now whenever I eat pumpkin, I just really am embrace it I just I'm like I love this so much it's so delicious and there was a time that I couldn't eat it and now I'm so thankful that it is back in my diet and it's kind of funny when I look at it so positively but I had to be really conscious that I didn't get angry at the pumpkin it just was my body wasn't quite ready for it and it wasn't the pumpkin's fault <laughs> it wasn't the pumpkin's fault. I love it. And so let's get back to the clear here. And so C, consciously eating L, legal foods. And you just touched on something that was really critical. And so when it comes to legal foods, I typically follow Dr. C. Becker's SIBO uh, specific diet. She's done such a great job visually of it. And so I like that. Again, I'm a kind of a simple guy. And so I follow that or suggest my patients follow that. And so generally sticking to 
the the left side or the more legal side and including those for foods first and again what's really interesting and was your experience as well is is that sometimes foods that are considered legal may not agree with you and so that is i think the fact that makes it so challenging for people they're trying to follow all of these different diets whether it's scd aip gaps SIBO specific diet i mean there's just so many options it becomes really overwhelming so one i say find one that works for you and follow that one so just stick with one don't try to marry everything because that becomes extremely confusing then generally speaking if you're looking to expand your diet stay on the legal side of things and then with time work through that and then begin to incorporate the moderate or illegal columns and what's really interesting here is is that again let's just presume that pumpkin was actually an illegal food given that you responded to it fine previously it may have been for you that it would have been okay and so sometimes people say well i'm really wanting that one thing and it happens to be on the moderate or illegal side of things should i try it can i try it and i say you know what why not you may be fine with it and so what we've got to realize is that these diets are really just guidelines and the real generalizations but what it really comes down to is you and your body and we're all really unique unicorns we're not robots which it, you know would make treatment easier but would make life extremely boring and so we've got to recognize that there are unique differences and how you tolerate one food despite its arrangement on said table may still be be different for you and so i really you know like to suggest starting on the left side though just because that's you know most people tolerate the lower fodmaps better uh but then with time reintroducing from the moderate or illegal columns and, and slowly working your way up now when it comes to the amount of time i because i oftentimes get that question is like well how long do i need to be restrictive in that sense and generally you know there's a lot of contention during treatment how should i do things my my goal generally is just let's choose a diet that limits symptoms and so i know there's some ideas around there that in theory are very valid that you should be you know incorporating higher fodmap foods to introduce or bring out the bacteria and again theoretically that makes a lot of sense but most people they you know they may be married they may have children many people have jobs some people are in school i mean there's so many variabilities and do we really want to spend 4 6 8 weeks feeling extremely horrible because we're trying to bring out the bacteria to me it it, it seems somewhat short-sighted and so during treatment minimize the symptoms following treatment stay more restricted and if you're actually doing some of the healing and recovering of the digestive system which mind you can happen very quickly because that digestive lining is being replaced constantly. And so I've I've heard people say too, "Oh, it's going to take me, you know, like 10 years to get over this leaky gut." No, no, no. Your 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 digestive lining is healing provided you've removed the obstacle or the bacteria and the inflammation is reduced. There's no reason why it shouldn't within a month or two come back with with the necessary supplementation and support. And so definitely it it doesn't need to be a long term diet and i see a lot of that as well being on a low fodmap diet for years and years has a lot of potential for negative consequences and and i feel like we could do another whole podcast on that and who knows maybe we will one day um but it is really really critical to recognize and i think we talked about this earlier that it's not about the food it's about the bacteria and so if presuming we've eradicated or are in the process of eradicating the bacteria these legal foods should be something that are a short term strategy to reintroduction and so that will then take us further into the urn uh rebecca do you have any questions at this point or want to chime in at all What would be your advice to people listening on how to provide the right kind of protocol or diet for them? Because it definitely is one point of major frustration and concern and stress and anxiety for people around looking at all of these different diets and not knowing which one is right for them. How do you get your patients to find the right diet for them? I think in many cases they come to me already with some preferences. And so I don't try to, you know, say, oh, okay, if you're already doing gaps, 
oh no, you got to come on over and do SCD or AIP or any one of the other ones. To me, I, I won't, I don't even encourage any one diet over another, to be honest. I mean, generally focusing on more low FODMAP is definitely uh, something that I you know, advocate. And having a table like uh, the SIPO specific diet, you know, lays that out very clearly. Now, what these diets are really great for is, is that they provide more of the education around how you can reintroduce, what length of period and time periods. But really, I try to simplify it as much as I can. And, and oftentimes, people are fearful when they begin working with someone who is a naturopathic doctor or, in your experience, a nutritionist because they're thinking, oh, I know if I go to them, they're going to remove more foods. And what I always tell people is, is we may initially remove more foods. Our goal always is to look to bring back more foods. And so even if in the beginning we say, okay, I think you should remove that and that, we're always trying to counteract it with try adding this. Maybe you want to try coconut milk. Maybe you want to try some more fats and oils. And so really trying to find other ways to add versus continually focusing on subtracting. Because again, if you get yourself in that mindset of I'm always limited and your mind is there, well, your health will be there as well. And so it really is, is kind of seeing it on the other side of, of the coin, if you will. And so generally speaking, low FODMAP, if someone has a preference and they want to follow a GAPS or any of those other ones, I'm totally there. I'm totally for it. But again, those diets are going to have pieces of them that may not work for you at this time. And what I will say is, is that I truly don't believe any one diet in and of itself is sufficient to treat a real true case of SIBO. I just don't. And it, what often happens is, is those diets with time shrink, 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 and shrink. And then you get to the point where you're only on three foods. And so I, I don't put a lot of emphasis, as maybe you can tell, on you know choosing one over the other. If someone will benefit from choosing one, then then I'll suggest you know maybe look into this one or you know this one has an app. Maybe you want to try that. And so it really comes down to the person, and I think that is you know really what healthcare is about is is trying to find what would work best for them. And what I always say is is if the plan that we create is not one that you can follow. It could be the best plan, but it's going to be the worst one because you're not going to get any results because you're not going to implement what I say. And so people will come to me and will say, oh, my doctor told me to read this book and that book and that book. And here they are. They don't even have the energy to get through their day. And so it's like, how can we make it really simple so that we know exactly what to do and how to do it? And so generally, low FODMAP, if you like another one, choose it. But choose it and just go with it and don't, you know, be worried about what everyone else is doing. And I think allowing yourself the permission to look ev- elsewhere as well. Let's say um, if you're following a low FODMAP diet and it's not working for you, that we have the permission to go on and find something else that does work for you. You don't have to follow it just because it's worked for somebody else that you know. And I've got a great example. For me, the SIBO biphasic diet by Dr. Narala Jacobi worked really well for me. I will say that there were some foods that she didn't have on the list and I didn't know if I was allowed to eat them or not and I ate them. I ate raw cacao powder um, from pretty much much day one and I was making myself my own chocolate with coconut oil and 100% natural stevia for those times that I just needed something that I could feel like it was a little bit of a treat. And then when Dr. Narala Jacobi and I made contact with each other and I asked her, can I actually use this? She said, oh, gosh, no. That should be when you're in the maintenance phase. Yet I'd been able to tolerate it from day one. So technically it should have been later in my treatment program, but it was food that was absolutely fine with me and I only knew it because I had actually just eaten it. So I was just adding it in without even knowing that I wasn't supposed to. And the biphasic diet, as I said, worked really well for me. And then a friend of mine, having watched my journey, said, well, I wonder if I've got SIBO. And so I gave her the details of my naturopath and she went and got tested. And sure enough, she had SIBO. 
But the biphasic diet didn't work so well with her and she has now moved on to the fast-tracked diet and she's really enjoying it and feeling like it is much more suitable to her and that she feels like she's actually making progress. So again, you know, giving yourself the permission to find, to keep experimenting, to keep looking for something that works for you and just using these diets as a guide that can help support you find a range of foods that work. I do wonder about the use of some of these terms, banned foods, illegal foods, and I do wonder what impact that has on our psychology as humans, being told these foods, in effect, are negative with the use of the words that some of these lists or these protocols use. And I'm sure that that is having a subconscious negative impact on the way we perceive foods and something that we have just been talking a lot about Um, in the first step of your protocol, the conscious step around being more positive and loving towards our food rather than being so negative. Do you see anything with your patients around fear around these illegal or banned foods as they are prescribed on these protocols? Yes, without a doubt. I mean, it's the wording is setting up our bodies. Again, it's kind of like, are we going, you're, you're, presuming you're going to be going on stage to give a presentation when you're reintroducing a new food because it is on a list that someone created and based on that food's components is considered to be you know legal or illegal and so definitely definitely and I mean I I I can't talk enough about the importance of getting your mindset on track and this doesn't just come to health it comes to every single part of your life and it starts with your language and your language dictates the way you're speaking and the way you're speaking dictates the way you're acting. And so that's what really frustrates me when uh, a healthcare provider will say, well, you'll never get better or this disease is only a chronic one. You'll may just, you just may reduce the symptoms. And to me, it is so short sighted because that is prejudging someone based on some statistic that may exist somewhere or their own experience. And so, I just think that, you know, there's so much to be said about the mindset and wording is really, really critical. And so if I could, I would just say, you know, not right now versus not right, you know, not forever. And so when it comes to the earn side of things, so we've talked about the C, L, and now we're on to the E. When it comes to earning, you're going to now because you're you're consciously eating, you're aware with what's going on with your body and you're able to interpret that response You can try move and let's just say from left to right and just to clarify left being the more legal and right being the more illegal and I know we covered this a little bit so let's just say left to right versus using those foods now what I typically suggest is is that and again we've talked a little bit about this but choose a food that you 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 well one that you know can be used in different dishes so I think when you're already limited, choose a food that you're already, you, you know when adding it will allow you to have more variety just based on, oh, well, now you may be able to bake with it or cook with it or put it into some other sort of uh, form. And so choose it, but choose it in more of its purest form. And so you can't really go out there and buy something that has it has pumpkin, but it also has a bunch of other ingredients. And if you do that, you're never really going to know which is the one that you didn't react to if you did happen to have a bad reaction to it. And so choose it in its purest form. I typically suggest, you know, you've got to uh, take it once. If you feel fine with it, take it again that same day. And you can do that two to three times that day. And then give your body several days to see if that response is going to be generated. Now, I guess, again, the caveat here is, is that if you're having a ton of symptoms as it exists right now, reintroducing is not going to give you a clear outline as to what works or what doesn't. Because if you're already horribly reacting to everything, then trying to reintroduce something else will give you no valuable information. And this is why the reintroduction is typically introduced further along. Having said that, if you currently are experiencing symptoms, you reintroduce a new food and it doesn't make you feel any different than you might if you had just eaten something that you're already okay with, then chances are you will be fine with it. The other side of this is is that you've got to distinguish between what is your body's general just response to this new food because you've not eaten it in some time. 
And what happens is, is if you've been avoiding certain foods or certain food categories for an extended period of time, certain digestive enzymes may not be produced. And when that's the case, it's going to take a little bit for your body to build up that response. And so there's a definitely a part of this urn step or process that requires you to push through some symptoms. Now, if you experience, you know, horrible indigestion, gas, bloating, nausea, headaches, you know, if it was a real overt response, you know, you did too much. It was too soon. You need to wait a little bit and then potentially reintroduce it again. But if you experience a little bit of symptoms, you may just need to work through it. And in the process of working through it, your body will begin to tolerate it much better. And you'll realize actually that it is fine with you. But you should notice a clear response. And if you aren't, and it's just a little bit of symptoms, give it some time, give it a chance, give it a second chance. And that will allow you because just think about it, for example, for someone, you know, let's say you were drinking a lot of alcohol, and you drank all the time. <clears throat> you what you might notice that with time, you can handle more and more alcohol because your body is producing the enzymes necessary to break up the alcohol. Now, if you stop drinking for some time and you went on a, you know, three months, I'm going to go on a cleanse, stop drinking, stop doing all these fun things. And you start to drink again before you may have been able to have a bottle of wine. Now one glass might have you feeling tipsy. And that's because those same enzymes have been downregulated. And the same goes for dairy and the same goes for many other food categories because our bodies are designed to produce the enzymes necessary to digest the foods we're consuming. And so if we stop consuming them, our body is not going to unnecessarily produce something we don't need. That's a really interesting point. And I think that it's really important for people that are very restricted to be aware of that. And it's funny you talked about the alcohol because I used to drink quite often. I lived in London for seven years and all the socialising there is done in the pub over a glass of wine or a pint of beer or something like that. So my tolerance was incredibly high. But these days I don't drink all that often and I can get a cracking headache after one glass of wine. And where in the past I could drink a whole bottle and sometimes I didn't even feel that it was really affecting me. Um, but I can understand the logic then for for let's say you haven't been eating broccoli for years and then you start to um, try and reintroduce it and broccoli in and of itself isn't a problem but it's like your body is just going whoa what is this we haven't seen broccoli in years what do we do with this yes I 100% agree with you there Rebecca it is one of those things where our bodies think it's something that is new or foreign or, or, or different but really our bodies need to just build up a response, a sufficient response, and a part of that response is producing the necessary enzymes and, and digestive components that will help to break that down. And the same applies to, you know, a heavy protein meal or a dairy meal or otherwise. And so it's just a matter generally of time. And so there's a part of it that is pushing through for sure. And so when it comes to this urn, as we talked about a little bit, and, and I feel they're kind of meshed together, but as I said, you're starting more on the left side, you're moving more to the right, presuming you're continuing to heal, recover, repair, you're going to slowly begin to reintroduce foods, not only in the left or let's call it legal again, but moving slowly to the right into the more illegal and with time what was considered illegal now becomes legal and so this kind of naturally carries us into the next part of this and that when you really begin to reintroduce there's so many foods that you could choose and and okay did I try that one how did I feel and so I really suggest you actually write it down and create a bit of a schedule for it so that you're actually clear on what am I doing and how did I respond to it so that two weeks later you're not thinking, oh, how did I do with pumpkin again? Was it okay or wasn't it okay? And so actually just write it down. And what I what I've called, and maybe this is a better word for it, but if you didn't, you know, your body responded and reacted to that food that you reintroduced or tried to reintroduce, I would suggest you put it on an alert list. And so it's just to be alerted that right now it's not right for me. But that doesn't mean that it's going to forever not be right for me. And so take the time to reintroduce. If something comes up, 
put it onto your alert list, give it a few days for your system to get back on track again, and then reintroduce. And so if you're presuming that it takes two to three days to introduce a new food, in any given week, you can reintroduce two to three foods, presuming you're healing and recovering the way you should. And so just think about it. It's not going to take you very long before you're eating a lot of foods. Now, if you think about it, the general population is kind of just eating a combination of 10 to 15 foods as it is. Now, I see that as being a problem, but this really can, if you do it properly, begin to expand your diet very quickly. And so, again, we don't want to rush. We don't want to push. My motto with all things treatment and recovery is start low and go slow. But it shouldn't take you very long to reintroduce foods. Now, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, there is one caveat. And that caveat is, is that there may be some foods, and most people know what those are, before SIBO ever even became a problem. For some people, they just do not handle dairy well, or soy, or eggs, or something of that nature. And so those foods may take some more time to come back from, and there are ways to decondition, if you will, your body's immune reaction and immune response to those foods, if indeed they're not true allergies. But that's you know another sort of discussion for another day. And what I'll generally say is, is that long-term, most patients and generally most people do well or do better on a low carb diet. And so let's just reiterate and then close it off with the clears protocol uh, with the restore. So again, C, consciously eating. That's really having an appreciation, gratitude, and, and, and welcoming the food that you are consuming. The L is legal foods. So sticking to the, the left side of the column. And when you are reintroducing and earning you're bringing them back more on the left and slowly working your way to the middle and right as you go. And you can reintroduce foods every two to three days, uh, just depending on how you respond. And the importance of waiting a few days is because the immune reaction and the immune response can take two to three days. And so that's why it's, it's critical not to try to just do a food a day because you may do a food a day and on day three, you could be reacting to one of the foods you had on day one, two, or three. So you gotta give the body a little bit of time to, if it's going to, generate a response. And if it's not, that's great. So you've got created an earn list. Some foods may not work for you at this time. So you put them on your alert list and you remove them for now and you have a date. Again, you could try that same food in a, in a month, uh, two months or whatever, or just kind of, when you feel like it would be best for you again. And again, if you're being conscious, if you're being aware, if you're really being in tune with your body, you're gonna have a much better sense for when that food is okay to reintroduce versus what some book or some, you know, some whatever tells you to do. And so it really does come down and back to getting in tune with your body. And so lastly, restoring. A part of restoring means bringing back and rebuilding the microbiome. And what is a critical component to this is having variety in your diet. And that's why reintroduction is so, so critical and why treatment to get you to the stage of reintroduction is so, so critical because there's, you know, blooming and blossoming research on the microbiome. And it's critical to have diversity in that microbiome, not only in species, but in numbers you need to have a varied diet because certain bacteria will feed off of certain food types and food categories. And so if you're very restricted to your diet, your microbiome is also going to be restricted. And based on some of the research that's been done, our microbiome is built up and, and, and is kind of has its own fingerprint, as I like to say. And that fingerprint became built through the years, uh, the first several years of life. Now, you know, you were born and you got a whole bunch of bacteria. You were breastfed if you were and you got a whole bunch of bacteria. You were, your environment was such, maybe you were running around in the muck and swimming in, in, in duck ponds like I was. And so, you know, your bacteria is different. But it's really developed in those first years. And what happens is, is that our bodies want to get back to that same microbiome or fingerprint. And they will if we give them the support that they need. And so part of this is, is removing the bacteria that are causing this, this imbalance because that will allow the 
let's just say they're good bacteria to thrive again, even though I don't like those distinctions that great. Um, and so those bacteria will be able to come back and then feeding them more foods will bring them back even more. And then again, you can decide to do things like probiotics. Typically, I'm suggesting to avoid prebiotics, at least initially, but with time, it can become safe to do that. And then I think, you know, it's been a lost art is using and introducing fermented foods. I think it is so, so critical and important. But again, I can't stress enough, starting low and going slow. I think it's easy to just say, oh, I'm going to buy a bottle of kombucha or a whole can of sauerkraut and I'm just going to inhale it. That could be too much too soon. So always, always, when it comes to reintroducing fermented type foods, start slowly and begin to build that up and so your system gets used to it. But generally, I don't suggest jumping to fermented foods right away. I know some people do. And again, when it comes to probiotics and fermented foods, some people will start it earlier on in the process and feel amazing. Some people will start it earlier and feel horrible. I find generally that more people feel worse than do feel better. So I make general suggestions, but my suggestion typically is, is let's wait until you've gotten rid of the bacteria because remember, it's not about the bacteria. It's not about the foods, it's about the bacteria. So get rid of the bacteria, then bring back the microbiome and do your best to try to avoid therapies like hardcore antibiotics that will again, wipe that out again and diets that don't facilitate that normal growth and so there's a big part of this and again you know we could talk about this you know maybe in some other time about what to do after the fact because getting rid of this digestive problem is generally for a lot of people the start of the journey and it might seem like oh wow that's you know I feel like that would get me to the end of my journey but there's this whole other side of how do we prevent it from coming back again and how do we really build up a system that is vital and that can handle any types of, of, you know, if this were to come back again in, in some other form, like you said, you're traveling through Thailand and it happens to be flooding and, you know, no, ordinarily our bodies should be able to handle this. And if it does present itself, we should be able to kick it out and move on. And so there's just a, another whole side to living vitally. And that's something that, that is really, really crucial. And so that is the, the long and short of the clear protocol. Um, if you've got any questions for me, just let me know, Rebecca, and I'll be happy to, to, to get into any more specifics on this or others. I think the clear protocol is very easy to follow. Like you said at the beginning that you wanted something that was really easy and simple that people could follow. And the restore piece is one of interest for me. And I'll share with the listeners my approach because it worked for me. Again, what worked for me doesn't necessarily mean it will work for everybody. But my naturopath and I decided not to include any fermented foods until we knew through my second breath test that my SIBO had gone. We'd got the numbers of bacteria back down into a healthy range. And then I slowly started introducing literally one teaspoon every few days of sauerkraut um, and only one fermented food at a time. So I'd do sauerkraut for a couple of weeks and slowly, slowly building it up. And then I made my own homemade coconut yogurt and again a teaspoon at a time and slowly building that up and then I'd look at kombucha and other fermented foods but being very gentle with my system and very interestingly it's only now that I am well and truly past the SIBO that are we now looking at um, and using probiotics and I feel great on them but we've been very um, like you say go slow and low and we are slowly, methodically working our way through re rebuilding the health of my gut. And I'm pretty certain that if I still had SIBO and I still had a much unhealthier, poor little digestive system, that I would have ended up violently ill from being in floodwaters, which had sewage and all sorts of stuff in it. And... Um, and what I got instead was a few days of pain and abdominal discomfort. And I'm actually really excited that my body seems to have handled it pretty well, all things considered, because I know what I would have been like in the past. 
Something that you said to me prior to our podcast interview today was that illness can often be a catalyst for change. And I think that it would be a great point for us to finish on because I know that my chronic illness that I had for 36 years has been the biggest catalyst for change in all aspects of my life. And I'm actually, it probably sounds a bit weird, I'm actually really grateful for it now because I'm now really excited about the next 36 years and beyond of my life because so much has changed because I got that SIBO diagnosis. What do you see with your patients in your own life around illness being a catalyst for change? Mm, yeah, and then, you know, just sitting here and hearing you reiterate what I, you know, would have shared with you at another point of time, it, it's just, you know, to me, it brings comfort and it brings, it takes away from the randomness that can be overwhelming in life. And if I, the way that I think about it is, is that we're all really put here to do something important. And that doesn't mean you've got to be, you know, acclaimed and recognized by everybody. That could mean you're just, you know, you're a stay at home mom, you're a stay at home dad, you know, you're like my generations of family, which were dairy farmers. There could be many reasons for that. And what can happen is, is that along the way, you may get distracted from what you're really here to do. And at times, illness presents in your life to refocus you and to bring you onto the track that you need to be on. And what can happen is, is that if you don't listen into the signs and, and symptoms are truly just your body trying to tell you that something's going on and that you need to pay attention to it. It's there for a real reason. Pain is, you know, it's, it's, it's a gift, really, because if it weren't there, we wouldn't know that anything was going on and suddenly we would just die. It's kind of like if your heart is, you're, you're having trouble breathing because your heart isn't pumping effectively, well, that's a really good thing to know because now we can correct it, whether it be, you know, with some sort of therapies, diets, surgeries, operations, what have you. And so symptoms are really, truly a, a good thing. It's just that when the body, you know, the immune system becomes really overwhelmed and just gets really flighty and really scattered and attacks everything that comes its way, that can create real issues. But a part of healing is, is recognizing how this served you. Because if you truly harbor a lot of regret and remorse and anger and resentment about being where you're at right now, Again, it comes back to the mindset and you're not going to be able to move yourself out of this state of, of, of toxicity, out of victimhood. And when you're in this state of, of you know, I'm not going to get it better. I won't get better. I've been dealing with this for so long. Why me? Why now? Uh, you know, you could just mope and, and find yourself in there. And again, I recognize that. I, I feel your pain. I understand but what we have to acknowledge is, is that, one, if we truly want to get better, we've got to take personal responsibility for our health. At the end of the day, we got us where we currently are. And so with that same line of, line of thinking, we can get ourselves to where we want to be. And if we find ourselves in this state of poor me and, and I'm not going to get better and I won't get better and, and why doesn't something just happen in the government and healthcare and, I mean, you go on and on. Are you really going to be thinking about what are the little things that I could begin to do today so that tomorrow is going to be better than today and that the next day is going to be better? And when we create a clear vision of what we want for our health and our life and all components, our, our body and our mind begins to go to work to make that a reality. Our immune system, our everything about us is it's so combined, the, the psychology and, and the physical component or the spirituality and the physical, it is so combined. And so if we, if we tarnish it and really, you know, break it down and, and, and make it one that has no light, that has no cheer, that has no hope, you're not going to make the decisions today that could change tomorrow and really adjust the trajectory of your life. And so if you see your health as something that is, is presenting to you so that you're here to learn something from it and you take the information it's giving you 
and then do something with it. And that may mean you've got to change your career. That may mean the relationship you're in is toxic. That may mean a lot of things. And for a lot of people, it's it's fairly simple. It could be that their diet was no good, that their lifestyle was no good, that they were you know out late and partying all the time. Or, I mean, they were using you know, drugs. Or, I mean, you name it. There's just so many things that can contribute to illness. And there's other things that we don't have as much control over, but that we can manage around. Now, there's environmental toxicities, and there's just a whole host of other things. But it comes down to that mindset and truly our bodies cannot differentiate between what we perceive to be real and what we believe to be real. And so I always, always suggest creating a clear vision of what health is going to look like for you. Because if you continue to stay and live in the moment of it, it's kind of like the world is closing in on you and you're in a box and that box is getting smaller and smaller and darker and darker. And then you feel like you're only that you're the only one there and you find yourself anxious and depressed. And again, I understand that and I recognize that. But what we've got to do is break out of that box and start thinking and feeling and believing and giving appreciation for where we're going to be. And when we get ourselves in that mindset, it will be amazing. The people, the practitioners, the things that you're going to attract into your life that are going to support you in that journey. So take where you're at and use it as something that you're going to learn from, that you're going to use it as a teacher and integrate it into your life and give gratitude for where you're going to be, even if you're not currently there. And so if we don't learn the lesson now, it may have to come back to teach us in some other form. So take what you can from it. Again, it comes back to this conscious side of things and being more aware and being more mindful and, and being more grateful and all of these things because that's really, you know, in that silence, silence can be louder than, you know, death metal music, if you will. And so really, you know, I, I would just really, really encourage people to create a vision of, of where they want to be and, and all of the smaller components and the smaller pieces of this, what diet, what book, what, you know, all of these things will come to pass. They'll come true. They'll come, they'll become clear to you. It's a matter of snapping yourself out of the state of mind and moving yourself into one that is truly supportive, healing and restorative in that sense. Definitely. And it's, it's very much a journey that I had to go on. I quit my corporate job. I had to really address um, the relationship that I was in. Um, and we had a quite a long break from each other, actually. Uh, I had to go and do some work on myself. I had to, I found um, an incredible psychologist who helped me with my mindset piece because I realized that my mindset had been really affecting me. I had been sick all my life, so I only saw myself as a sick person. So how do you see yourself as a healthy person when all you've ever known is chronic illness? So I really had to change that. Um, and the other thing that I had to do was I had to, well, I had to do a lot of things. I had to um, step away from from some friendships because they weren't supporting me. I had to address my lifestyle because my sleep was haphazard. I was going to bed far too late. I wasn't exercising regularly. Um, I went and found a personal trainer who I still work with to this day um, so that I had accountability, so that I was moving my body. Um, and the other thing in Australia is well, well, we do have healthcare here, um, and, but we don't get free healthcare um, most of the time especially not our um, alternative health practitioners like naturopaths. Uh, to go through SIBO treatment was incredibly expensive and being self-employed by that point, I didn't have a regular income and I had to consciously choose where to spend my money because there wasn't a lot of it. There wasn't like I had money just pouring in. And so I chose to spend my spare money or my money on my health. Uh, by eliminating the alcohol I didn't drink for some months and by choosing really healthy food, I was able to put the money that I would have other sp spent on going out and drinking and getting drunk and you know doing all of that stuff, um, which was fun but not supporting a lifestyle of health. Um, and I put it towards my naturopath and, um, and the other services like a psychologist and um, a personal trainer. Uh, I'm really glad I made that investment in myself because today, where I am today, which is still my journey to health, that I'm not at the end point, um, is such a better place than where I was two years ago. And 
it's almost to the day actually. Um, in two days' time, I commenced my SIBO treatment two day, two years ago. So it's been a pretty incredible journey, but I, it has been one where I've had to make a lot of conscious decisions to move towards a vision that I want or a lifestyle and a life of health that I want for myself in the future. Uh, and that can take some challenging decisions, challenging conversations with people. But at the end of the day, we only have one go at this. Um, we only have one body at this point. We haven't figured out how to do a full body transplant yet. Uh, so I'm going to make the most of it. And if that means having some tough decisions and tough conversations with people about what's right for me, not what's right for them, then I'm, go- I'm going to do it. And I'm really, um, you know, I'm, I never realized how strong I was as a person until I started going through this journey. And I'm really proud of what I've been able to achieve. And I know that there's so many people listening to this podcast who are strong and they should be proud of everything they do for themselves because they're working towards um, obtaining their health which is just fantastic oh that's so beautiful and I you know if you didn't have that clear vision for yourself as in what you wanted you very likely wouldn't have introduced and implemented those different components and wouldn't continue to strive for it and so it's you know someone who focuses their whole lives on being extremely wealthy will do whatever it takes, right? Hire coaches, do trainings, do all these different things, potentially at the expense of their health. But it really, I mean, you've got to decide and you've got to recognize that I'm going to compromise in some other ways so that I can get to this goal that I'm creating. And if you don't truly create a goal, you've got nothing to work towards. If you don't create a vision, you've got nothing to see yourself as. And you're going to make very different decisions than you might otherwise. Definitely. Dr. Jason Klopp, it's been wonderful having you on the Healthy Gut podcast today. If people would like to connect with you, how can they find you? Yes, uh, just definitely an awesome, amazing time. I really enjoyed doing this with you, Rebecca. I think uh, I've always listened to your your amazing accent here in Canada, and I, and I just I, I love it. I think you've got such depth of understanding, and so thanks so much for for inviting me to come on. Uh, the best way to get in touch with me is is well, there's maybe two ways. One is I, I've got a Facebook group, and, and that's really lively, and I really enjoy that. It's called Treat and Beat IBS slash SIBO naturally. And I've also recently done a free training that I got a lot, a lot of positive feedback from. Uh, and you can find that at www.beatsebonaturally.com backslash webinar. And that's, again, a great, amazing free resource. And if someone, you know, I also welcome, you know, uh, the Facebook messages or just email jason at drjasonklopklop.com. I'd be glad to hear your guys' feedback. And if you've got any more specific questions, Again, it's my understanding that Rebecca is going to be sending you some more of these condensed notes. And so, uh, again, I'm really, really grateful for for you giving me this opportunity and this platform to share what I believe to be uh, a vital message. And and I think I'd like to end it on uh, hope. Keep believing that you have the capacity and the capability to, to get and stay healthy. Because if you continue to hold on that, there's really nothing that can keep you and prevent you from it. And I forget who uh, had the quote or had the saying. And and if I had felt this urge earlier, I would have said it. But there's physical suffering. But physical suffering doesn't mean that you need to emotionally or physically or spiritually continue to suffer. There is really a difference. And it's that recognition that, that you do not need to be a victim of your circumstances, but that you can really be a victor. And so keep that hope, keep that light and keep that joy. And and when you focus on it, it will expand and it will grow in your life. Wonderful words to end this podcast. Thanks for coming on the show, Dr. Jason Klopp. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Jason Klopp. If you would like to get a full transcript or the show notes or access a download of the CLEAR protocol, all you need to do is head to thehealthygut.co forward slash CLEAR. And I'm sure you will find the download incredibly useful as I have. It's been really great learning about Dr. Klopp's new protocol. So just head to thehealthygut.co forward slash clear. 
Don't forget to leave us a rating and review in iTunes or the app you use to listen to this podcast. I love hearing your feedback and it also helps other people listening to this podcast know that that is the right podcast for them to hear more about gut health. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, Google+. Just look for us under The Healthy Gut. Coming up on next week's show, we're joined by the incredible nutritionist Jessica Cox. Jessica specialises in gastrointestinal uh, nutritional support and we have an excellent interview with each other and she talks through how she uses nutritional support to help people with irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO. So make sure you tune in next week to listen to my interview with Jessica Cox. And if you're interested in learning more about the SIBO coaching program, which I'm about to launch in the very near future, you can head to thehealthygut.co forward slash interest to register your interest in the program and I will send you out some information. To make it fair to everybody, because I only have a limited number of places on the program, I am giving everybody the opportunity to register their interest in the program and then I can tell you more about it and I can be sure that my program is going to be the right program to help take you on your journey towards health and wellness. So just head to thehealthygut.co forward slash interest to let me know you'd like to know about the program. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. And as we are fully funding this podcast, if you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast so that we can continue to bring you future episodes, all you need to do is make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Belinda Coombs for the production, editing and original music score of this podcast. To hear more of Belinda's music, head to soundcloud.com forward slash Belinda Coombs. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.